The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. Okay, so this is the second of two sessions. Uh, please ignore the title on this. I'm only putting it up there so you can see that my name is Jeff Probst. Today's date is June 7th. We're here at SELF 2013 and we're talking about CHRK. Uh, the second session will be almost entirely on a VM. We'll be diving in and actually making CHRK fails together. This could go horribly wrong, I'm warning ahead of time, which is a touch and go process at times. We're hoping that it goes wrong. If it doesn't, then you get to experience the joys of building a CH root jail. It'll be very accurate. So this one is CH root jail's application. With that said, let's get our start. There we go. There it is. All right, so now we have fixed our previous SSH issues. I think it's because I was on the wrong map and was giving a different IP. So. So let's start with a simple one. Let's start with a service that already understands CHRU. So one that's very commonly done. Uh, let's start with SSHD. So let's go into here. We're going to look at its config file and we'll see just how easy this is to do. And I don't want to hear anything about that versus Emacs. We're all friends here. Don't want to do that. And oh my goodness, what is that color? Can you guys see that? Yeah, let's try. Okay, so we're not going to use them. That's too hard to see. Actually, we're going to use the subsystem of SFTP. Uh, this is the file transfer protocol portion of SSH. We want to use a specific server. Now, when I want to see a true user, and he's logging in, he's going to be logging in to this server. So, in order to do a CHRU jail for a user using this subsystem, I would have to go and find SFTP server, put it in the right place, to find all the libraries, to all that business, you know, normal work. Thankfully, SSH understands you don't want to do all that. It has an internal SFTP service. And what this allows us to do is that the SSHD thing will have the SFTP server portion of it because it's got a lot of these different pieces built in. They'll have it already up in RAM, ready to go. All the uh, files required. Remember we talked earlier about how you can open a file handle and then see it through afterwards. So it's going to have all of its file handles open already and it's going to be taken care of. So with a couple change of commands, you can set up a CH root user. So let's do this. Match user CH root. Let's do this. Match group. I think that's the right. The fact that it's not doing syntax modeling tells me I'm probably wrong about that. Right? Also, I'm forgetting. 
That's, yeah, I forgot to have first ice cream session. Or so. Super secret password of foot, and we'll never guess it. Okay, so now I've set up a, a new user. I've given him the password. I have put him, that's what this part is right here. In addition to the group that's been created for the user, he's also going to be added to the CH group. group. Let's see what happens. We'll just go for it now. Oh, that didn't work. Great. First example of going so well. Let's see what I did here. Test Let's go check that out. Where do we go check that out? It's a very good point. Look at this. We have found in our log file, this is the, in, in Ubuntu, it's called auth.log, and in Red Hat and derivatives, it's called secure, I believe. This is more or less the equivalent of a file uh, describing anything having to do with logins or security, anything. Um, here, we tried to log in as that user. right here. I hope that's still visible. You really can't see that right now, can you? So here we're checking the password, or we changed the password, that's fine. Here we're logging in. Logging in as test user. Uh, Pam does this wonderful thing, opens a session. 
And then SSGHD tells us, just like Doug shared, that ownership of those procedures right here on the test user. So this is from our, I mentioned this earlier, that SSHD is really picky about its permissions. Let's go fix that. This has to be owned by a group of people. And then anything inside here, I'm just gonna have to have something you can use. For you. So now the permissions should be set up properly. Here's the local directory. Okay, so now it should be a little bit. Okay, now it's working. It was exactly right. It was a permission thing. Let's go see what I can get into. There's only one directory here. Let's try. Because of the way we set up the permissions, uh, I kind of glossed over that before. SSHD expects, requires, mandates, that whatever, see, whatever directory you see it root into is owned by root, has a group set to root, and is not writable by anything else. So it's very strict on that. And because we had set the home directory to be owned by the user instead, SSHD said there's no way we can actually keep this secure. We're not going to bother with this. So in this case, SSHD knows more than we do about CH rooting. Um, that's kind of embarrassing to admit, but it's very true. Um, but this is a very simple case. When I go to the root, I'm only seeing my home directory. I'm logged in as this user. My entire world is what's in my home directory. That's it. I can't. There's nowhere else to go. There's no other files. I can't go on the Etsy and see, oh, well, there's no directory there. I can't go and see, oh, let's go check out what's in the files. No, I can't do that. So this is the simplest CHU you can do. It's absolutely incredibly simple. And this is an example of a service who understands what it means to be CHU. Let's try this with one that doesn't understand what it means to be CHU. This will be a little more difficult. Uh, let's have some fun with Bob. Shall we? This could end very horribly. Patchy. 
That's not more difficult. I'm just going to show you how that is done. No, of course not. Next um, one's next. You know, we can do it. This is a terrible idea. We can do it. Let's go outside. Maybe. Just thinking about it. Very hard. Just thinking about it. That's probably what it is. You don't pee anymore. You're already downloading too much. Oh, come on! How many more is there? Oh, there it goes. It works. Okay, it just took its due time. I think uh, we've got a whole lot of entropy on this server, so it takes a little while for the keys to get there. Okay, so this is my terrible idea. Let's try to see the truth of something. Let's try to see through the Nginx. It does not know it's being see through. It does not function on the board. Let's see what happens. Most of your work you're going to have to do is root. So I just go ahead and escalate now. Maybe. This is this is too slow. I don't know what I can do this. Alright, let's get creative. We can't go outside because it's just too slow to use. Uh, Alright, see I wiped out my IV earlier. I brought it back to zero and I forgot to install certain packages. Let's see, what do we have on here that would be fun? What's Let's go ahead and continue with the SSH example. Could you maybe just copy the uh, for bind line from your remote box and then just go the package eye on it? Uh, probably can. Uh, let's let's let the I don't remember there being very many dependencies. Yeah, I don't think that's okay. Well, I don't want to go into that. That will distract us from what the original goal of this is. So what we'll do instead, we'll go a little deeper into the SSH signature. I guarantee we could spend hours on this. I'm not going to because we'll be exhausted. Um, so let's go a little deeper. Let's build a home directory CH root environment for a user that lets them SSH. I did not show this to you before. I will show you now. What happens if I try to SSH and it has the test user? Whatever that was. Ooh, can you see true parsing? We'll have that on the system already. See true parsing. Hmm. Yeah. Rsync D, it will not be so Rsync is. Rsync D is not. So now? Rsync D is not. Yes, it is. It's, it is? Okay, let's do that then. <laughs> Terrible idea number 14, let's go. Rsync is Rsync D, it's just Rsync 1 with the demon argument. Okay, so here we go. If you want it auto starting, you just gotta go into etc. default parsing and enable it there and then create a comp file and oof, etc. at the rsync start over here. Right now I'm naming all of my uh, screen sessions. <coughs> Something notable, so I'll have to come back to them, what they actually be. Uh real work being done. Let's just go to the right. Alright, so let's just pick a place. I tend to make a one bar these days. Uh, my example earlier. Uh, why put them down here? Let's go poke and see what our sync expects. This is our first step. Okay, it doesn't look so bad. So our first step would be to copy our sync itself and all these libraries into the CH room. Let's make a and then we'll also need a user bin directory because that's what it's expected to be. And then we're going to need a loop 64 directory. I don't think you want that lazy selection. Call. Blue, X, 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 X
four, we're going to need to copy ACL.ISO.1. Again, I, it's not that I don't believe you, it's just that I've always done it this way. It's force it to dereference. Uh, lib P opt. So that zero, I have no idea what that is. Apparently they use it. Lib C. Okay, and then lib attribute. And inside the lib sixty four directory we need this. Okay, so there's all of our libraries. I'm going to go into here. And then our sync. Copy to here. So this is the bare skeleton of what we think our sync will need to run. Let's see what happens. Exactly like the man said. So we didn't get everything. We now need to go find the config file. Let's go make that. And because we don't care about the content right now, we're just going to copy what's on the system. There is a point. Oh, okay. Let's go find an example. I don't think I have that still wrong. Our sync D example config file. Thirty-four. 
And we just want to check out what is available. So we're going to do an arson protocol again. So it's going to do that 16.3.4. This should print out everything that it's listed, right? Uh, actually, get rid of the RC colon slash slash and just put two colons after the IP address. After the IP address? Yeah, correct. Hey, it's working. Yeah. <laughs> that works really great. It was a simple service. We were able to see it true. The only thing that's available is this whatever I want definition. Now, let's say that we were using an old version of our sync because we're stupid. And this version of our sync has flaw in it that lets me take advantage of the flaw and take control of it. If this happens, let's look at all the possible things that someone could do in the CH room. The list is very short. The only thing we have in the NC directory is rcmp.com. The only thing we have are a couple of libraries, and those are the real only. Uh, the one binary and slash user slash bin and the sample data. So they can go trash your data. But that's going to happen anyway because your service and the data, if someone breaks into it, your data's trashed. It's very common. So what we've done here in the 10 minutes of stumbling around has created a relatively secure environment for our sink to live inside. If someone breaks into our sink or something happens, the corruption will stop at this directory. So the rest of my system, let's say I have some very important files that I just can't possibly live without. Um, those are all safe. They're protected. And our sink is running happily in some environment. We gave it everything it needed to exist, and that's all it needs. Would we still be able to trust that if we had one of the RCMP in the root? No. No. Because um, one of the ways to break out of the CH root jail is using root binaries. As a root, you can change directories around, you can access kernel directives, you can do a whole bunch of things. The easiest way to break out of this root if your root is you root again, you want to maintain a hold on the directory and access it. There's a very well known example for how to break out of a CH root jail. Uh, you don't have to look very hard on Google to find it. Google break out of CH root jail. Exactly. Second result. It requires someone to be root in order to do this. So, in this case, since we're running as nobody, that's really keeping us from doing is writing anywhere that nobody could normally write to outside of that CH root jail. That's a good way to put it. So, one of the things you never want to do in your CH root jail, and I was using ping earlier, we'll talk about that a bit. Uh, you never want to put anything that is set UID as root. Nothing that is run as root, nothing that can be run as root. Period in the story. Because that gives someone the means to break out of jail. And the whole point of jail is security and isolation. We don't want to break it out. So now here's an interesting point. All these files I copied into the CH root directory here, they're all on this root. I want to make a distinction here. Um, files can be owned by root. In fact, that's common in the CH root jail. They just cannot be made so that when you run a binary executable, it runs as the root user. Ping. Let's check that out. Ping is a program which requires set to UID root. Ping is something that should never, ever show up in your CH root jail. Ever. Because when you run ping, it doesn't matter who you are, ping, because it's actually manipulating uh, some networking items, has to be root. So this should never be in your CH root jail. This is kind of ironic. There's a tool called BusyBox, uh, which I've used before, to build very, very small uh, user environments. And it actually has a ping tool, which doesn't work. Because unless you set the BusyBox binary to be set UID root, ping can't do it. So I don't actually know why that's in there. Right, so that was a pretty good intermediate example. Let's take this up and up. Let's do a full home directory environment, something the user might actually want to use. Let's go to Dear Test Users Directory. Um, so when I log in with SSH, I am dumped at the console. And the program that I've dumped onto is Bash. So right off the bat, we know what we're going to need. Bash in our CH root. 
Let's bring that. I don't have anything for you to do. Oh, nope, we don't. Okay. I'm going to now we're going to need Ben. Remember from before, Ben, Lib. Where is Lib? Let's say 664. Yeah, we're going to need those two. Let's check out all the requirements of MASH. This is actually a lot better than it used to be. In 1004, this list was about nine lines long. It's really annoying. Um, now, there's, we're going to run into some issues here. Uh, having done this before, there are some pieces that are not listed in this tool, which are still mandatory, which we're going to hit that. And hopefully, by sharing this with you, I will save you your hair. Because Part of the reason why my hair is so thin is because I tore it out before the was teacher jails. So, let's copy these libraries in. Of course, I can't move the directory to itself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we need lib dl, which is going to be problematic. Precision is not my strong suit at times. Did we already get lib dl? We got t info lib c. Lib dl minus that. Copy that. Into x64. And then we need. Uh, we, could, we could spend quite a long time discussing what all these libraries are, what they do. Uh, there's an amazing amount of depth. Uh, once you start going into this, it's very hard to stop reading. At least I found it that way. It's fascinating. So let's see what happens with just our simple little shell here. We've got one file bash that no library is required. Let's go alter. Did we not need the Linux VDSO? That's a, a pseudo library. Oh. But I, I don't understand why they do that. Let's look at that again. Yes, this one right here, this line? Yeah. It's not a real library. It's some kind of library marker that's left behind. The ODD program picks it up and assumes that it's actually a library. It's like a blank. Yes, that sounds right. Okay. So you'll notice just about every single program that has this, if it has any kind of kernel manipulation or anything like that. You could say for the this line. And I, I guess I, I glossed over here because it didn't have a path. How can I copy something that doesn't exist? So let's see what happens. We go in and mess with the poor test users' uh, abilities a little bit more. Let's use. I thought we fixed it. Didn't we fix it? You fixed your Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> Alright, so I don't think we're making changes here. Yeah, it's see it's reading itself. Let's go see that. Let's go back and fix that, shall we? No, no, that's fine. Condition the users to expect that your support calls just give them <laughs> I like the way you think. I'm also scared by the way you think. Okay, so let's go into this and home test user. So he needs another couple of tools. Let's give him something. Okay, I'm going to give him a thing. LSN by, 
so it goes. Now, of course, because we've just added a new tool, we have to check and see, oh look, more libraries. Okay, let's go do this. So you see there's this treadmill here of libraries. Eventually you get to this point where you can stop needing them. But, um, I mean, is fucking all the libraries a bad idea? Okay, it's not sustainable. <laughs> Let's see. Do you want 210 megabytes in every single home, di home user's home directory? I don't. Make them hard lives. I could do that. I've also done AOFS before. Um, you can get creative with these things. You said they have hard lives? Yeah, they're kind of eating the purpose of the CA3. That's right, you are. If they manage to edit what's in that hard link, they just got their system on it. That's true. That's true. <laughs> so, no, we can't use hard links. And no, sim links won't go outside the CA3 because sim links are oh, able to. Copy them all to a disposable directory and then hard link that one to all of your users. There you go. That's what I was about to say. You, you, could, you could have one central copy for all of your CA3 users. If you didn't mind one CA3 user being able how I tend to handle things, um, if I'm doing lots of CHROOTs for users, I actually set up a centralized CHROOT environment that I'll deploy. It used to be called UNFS, now it's been supplied with AUFS. This is really cool technology where you can layer you know, different directories and call them all the same thing. So I'm going to layer, the lowest layer is going to be my CHROOT environment. On top of that, I'm going to layer the user's home environment. And what happens when a read request or a write request comes through is it falls through. So if someone is modified, uh, whether maliciously or just for fun or whatever, has modified a library in this layer, it will mask what somebody is here. So if someone wants to start hacking around, he ain't gonna impact any of the other users at all. And also this means I have one layer to maintain, um, one CHU jail to update. It's that's a advanced topic past an advanced topic. Stick around and talk with you guys about it if you like. Um, but here we're getting into part of the treadmill fun of uh, managing a stage with So, which of these do we not already have? Let's go find out. SC Linux, we don't have that. That's going to be fun. SC Linux, I just have that one, copy that here. I don't have web ACL. We don't have lib p thread. Oh no. Why do we want to do this one again? Well, this is this is just for LS, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah. you can see how a lot of a lot of binaries are not programmed with CHU. <coughs> They're not made to be easy. In fact, I think on 10.04 Bash had I think 12 different libraries. And there's something I haven't mentioned here, I probably should mention this now. Each of these libraries could themselves have dependencies on other libraries. I was actually hoping we would run into that problem with it, but it looks like in 1204 they had fixed it. So it used to be you had to bring in uh, NSS, uh, the NSS family of libraries for compatibility. NSS compat, DL, NSS compat files, and a whole bunch of other junk just to get bash work. And they don't think you can do reversible of those sort of things? No, that's a good question. Yes. I meant to do that. <laughs> curse. How do I get it to do that? There is, huh? Yeah. Maybe in the version that you've used before, it did that. Uh, this version and the ones I've tend to use, they don't do that. So, and we talked at the very beginning of the first session, kind of halfway through, about tools that help you build CHR jails. That's more or less what those tools are doing. They're doing an LEDB on the binary you're specifying, saying, we need all these things. Go make it happen. But they're imperfect because, as we saw, we copied all the necessary libraries in for our scene to work. And it still didn't work because it was lacking configuration files. These uh, make jail tools or <coughs> they're going to have the same exact problem. So this is where. Parsing work. 
perfectly without the config file. It did exactly what it's supposed to do, just so you know we did the config file. Okay, that is fair. That is fair. Yes, sir. And some of the two rules deal with the own uh, share pieces as well. In fact, you're going to deal with the other people find their findings. Okay. okay. So it's, it's kind of hit or miss. You don't always know. It's one of those things you learn through experience and doing it the wrong way a lot of times. That's, that's me and our people. So if somebody was clever, they write, they could write a script that does an LED, finds all the dependencies and copies them as needed. They have done that. Uh, the question for the video is that someone, if someone were clever, they could write a script that would LED recursively and copy all the things in the right place. So that's where those tools like MakeJL, I think, does it. Uh, MakeJL actually, I think, goes way beyond that and over engineers the solution to be far worse than just doing my hand. Uh, I think uh, make underscore jail tool will do that. Um, it's a good exercise to understand all these different pieces and how they go together. Just for fun. No, but now you're talking about getting to the hawk. And you'll get to learn about that on Sunday if you come to my session. So let's see. This library has, has dependencies libdl and libc. We got what the year. What about. They have really cleaned this up. It's a lot nicer than it used to be. And 10.04 is a nightmare to do this. I'm really happy that 12.04 is easier. Um, how are we doing on time, by the way? Got 20 minutes or so? Okay, good. Let's keep it. Have we copied all of our binaries in yet? No, we've got to start to copy through. Okay. We got SE Linux. We got. Did we get RT? Yeah. Okay. Okay, what does that mean? 
Okay, we got a weird error here. Profile or less, the less binary has its libraries like it's expected. We went through that process already. It's still missing something. So now it's immediately clear what it is. Okay, something terminal. Okay, great. What is that? Okay, term cap. Great. That's not fun. Okay, and I'm using what's my External to the pieces. Okay. So, is here? User live, not live. User share term cap, I think. Term is always. Where is this? Where is the term cap ever from? Did they move it? Here we go. This is the least amount of uh, functionality per to get cells work. So let's go make that. Uh, we're going to enter. We're going to copy PT100 into the very same directory we just created. Turn info B. Now let's see if it works. No. Why did I copy VT? That's great. Um, I'm really on top of it today. We're going to copy X term car this time. Okay, so now we're going to S trace less 
profile. Direct this to, all right, one thing I forgot to add here. Place for test user. Okay, so now the problem was we had no directories in this home directory of test users where he could actually write files to. So we could S trace all day long, we couldn't save it anymore. I just had to temporarily make some place for it to go. A place for you. Oh, that's so sweet. Okay, we're now going to S trace. What happens when we do this? This don't work. Okay. Now, I would love to look at this file inside my CHRU, except the very tool I need to look at it is the one that's not working. So we're going to go outside the CHRU, we're going to go into here, where everything is working fine. Let's go see what it's doing. Wow, that's a lot of stuff. Okay. We're looking specifically, remember I said earlier, when you're looking at S-Trace information, you're looking for things like opens, writes, or stats, or reads. We're looking for yeah. yeah, so there we go. One of the things you'll find when you start digging through S-Trace data is your program will actually look in multiple places for your library. That's where these ld.so.preload and ld.so.nl.hw.cap, those files, they're basically pre-caching the locations of where your libraries are. They are not strictly required for your program to work right. They certainly help its, you know, finding its libraries faster. So we're looking through here. It is going through, we're looking for in cursors in a whole bunch of different locations. Right here in the middle, we see that it finally finds it. Okay, great. It opens it. Okay, and it reads its contents out. So that's understand. Here we go, we got another library. Libc, libdl, same thing. All those are working great. Libt info. Okay, so here we see, this is where be our first clue if we're S-tracing this program. Our first clue that maybe we go looking for term with or return capers. It's statting these files. Stat is a status effect. Let's do that. So that uh, stat tells me all the information about the file that's pertinent for me to know. Access one by change, it's permissions. So you see, in S traces a lot. In S traces, you'll see a program stat a file first that will verify that it exists, and then actually go read from it. So here we see it statting in rapid succession, looking for a dot term info, a slash etsy slash term info, lib term info. It's not finding it anywhere. Actually, here it found this directory lib term info, and it starts going and looking for its file it's looking for. It doesn't find it. So it can't find an appropriate file anywhere to do its work with. It's looking all over the place for a whole ton of different operations. Any one of these things will allow it to do its, uh, its work. So part of the uh, investigative fun of building a CH root is there's lots of different ways to solve this particular problem. It's looking for all these different things it's looking for. Term info, syslist, locales. Uh, any one of those would like to solve this problem. And maybe it takes more than one. We don't know. But here's another interesting one. It's trying to open dev TTY. We don't have that in our CH root. So I'm actually not sure how this was able to work for properly without that dev TTY. Mm -hmm. I was kind of expecting it to call on that. And it didn't. So like I said, this could go horribly. There's lots of little nooks and crannies and things to understand and learn and to explore when you're building CH roots. There's lots of problem solving on the fly, requirements for understanding. And we're diving pretty deep into the system to understand what's going on. We're having a we're looking at the system calls that each one's making, each program's making. So, but here we've seen the tools, we use the LDD tool, we use the S-Trace tool, we were able to successfully build a home environment for the user, we were able to successfully see it through the service, um, we played with SSH, we've covered just about all the major cases. So when you're doing CHRUs, you now equipped with the basics to build what you need. It's a matter of scaling them up. You got more binaries, more tools. From here, if you're really serious about building CH roots for a home user or user's home directory, uh, 
I would look into a tool called BusyBox. This is an amazing piece of software that provides it's like 150 core tools down to 680 or something. Really awesome. BusyBox, I can't say that good things about it. Um, you said that it was like the shell? Uh, it's, it's the shell. It functions as LS. It functions as all, those, all these binaries you would expect to see in there. BusyBox takes the most commonly <coughs> used options and functionality of each of them and puts them into one binary. So how do you can have you protect binary in the shell? And actually, it's, if you use BusyBox as the shell, then it will interpret it all for you. If you use another item as the shell, then you'll have to make similar interpret. But see, BusyBox has lots of different op modes of operation. Um, and again, that's, that's a little too much depth for us to go into here. I just want to make your guys aware of it. It's an amazing tool for building CX routes with. Um, using BusyBox, you can automatically have a shell on every CX route. And it really helps you to troubleshoot what's going on like what we just did. Here. So. All right, so I think that's all I've got time to cover. Do you guys have any questions, uh, things that I wasn't clear on? Yes. Um, one of the things that I saw in the description of your talk was, you know, why, why not to see the three things. And the big thing I'm wondering right now is why in God's name is anybody not running Apache? Or, yeah, why is anybody not running Apache C? Because it's difficult. Because it requires, let's say it came from, I'm sorry? Oh, yes. He was asking, uh, he why, was saw, would not run Apache why would you not want to see it through all of your services? Or at least Apache specifically, because the difficulty involved in maintaining it. Um, Apache is highly modular. Different modules may have different library requirements. Um, it requires an in-depth understanding. We had to investigate the tools we were using. The more complex the tool we see each route, the more complex the requirements are to sustain it. Um, and at some point, it gets to be so large, you're just saying, we don't have time to do this. This is going to take too long too hard to maintain. Um, again, that's part of your risk analysis. Maybe you decide that it's too risky to run without a station HTTP D session. Um, that's all part of your risk assessment up front in deciding to use a station uh, well, That's a very good question. Anybody have other questions? Go for it again. Use case for C3 versus doing an LLC container. Uh, were you in the first session? The question was a use case for using CHroot versus an LXC container. Uh, I mentioned in the first session that LXC is kind of a, a step up from CHroot. It's far simpler uh, and it's outside the bounds of this particular presentation. I'd love to talk with you about it later. Actually, this gentleman was talking with me about it earlier too. Um, they are more advanced and more and more secure than CHroot jails, but I think in order to understand what Linux containers do, we have to understand what this is doing. So that's why. Uh, any other questions? Yes. So just talking about USTP, you know, when you set up the, the, the jail for that, you also have to open up a file channel for that logs. If you're logging, say you have an SSD log connection, are there any challenges in that security wise? Do you have an alt permission that type as well to be able to write to it? So does that open up any challenges when they're writing to that? That's going outside the system, the system logs somewhere else outside the jail. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. This question was, uh, when you're trying, like for example, when you're logging, you need to log to an external facility outside of the CHRU, uh, are there challenges associated with that? And the answer is very yes. I don't know if that's proper English, but I'm going to English anyway. Um, very yes. There's many different ways to handle this. Uh, a simple way would be to set up, say, a socket inside the CHRU that your system logging is listening to. We're just using logging as an example here, I assume. Yeah, yeah. I got it. The way I set up, I put a socket to share all the SSH users, mm -hmm. and I bind them back into their home directory, and all of this, because to log their root session, when they log in SSH, it has to write out that socket. Mm -hmm. And that socket's out to my logging in my firewall. See, that's, and he was saying he's done some CHRU work before, and he had to be binding on the socket in several different places. Uh, that's one of those situations where I don't know you can keep scaling that up. I would maybe look into using a TCP socket instead. Because um, I know syslog will also do TCP log. You have to set up the access controls properly on that. But at some point, you just decide this is too hard to maintain on a file based method. Use a socket based method instead, and a lot of those problems go away. There could be performance hits, anything like that. 
that all goes again into your decision. So. We have time for one more really quick question. Okay. Well, very good. You guys, thank you very much for coming for the session. I enjoyed it. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive, easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy to implement, easy to use, strong authentication. From Wicked. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astro Space systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astro or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astro. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.
Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing like that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think. When you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens. Uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support 
uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloud Stack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the Cloud Stack.